Good morning. This morning's topic is new roles in the art market, how curators, art advisors, investors, and art funds have impacted the marketplace. I would first ask, are there really new roles? The great years of the Duveen brothers from 1905 to 1939 were led by Lord Joseph Duveen of Millbank, who was a major donor to the Tate Gallery. He wisely moved the inherited company away from rugs and porcelain to old masters in response to the never-ending demand of the American squillionaires. His simple observation was that Europe had the art and America had the money. His uncanny ability to spot a hidden treasure was called the Duveen Eye. Andrew Mellon, one of his best and greatest clients, once said, paintings never looked as good as they did when Duveen was standing in front of them. I'm going to make brief introductions of our panelists. Uh, if you want to refer to uh, longer bios, please look at your booklet. Harold Falkenberg from Hamburg, Germany, is an industrialist, a collector, a professor of art, and a publisher of art books. Guy Jennings, residing in London, runs the Fine Art Fund, which is one of the most successful art funds in existence today. Alistair Hicks, also residing in London, is the curator of Deutsche Bank's vast art collection, one of the few corporate collections that continues to evolve and expand its commitment to collecting. Additionally, he is the head of the art advisory service for Deutsche Bank, helping clients to buy and sell art. Each panelist has had a long professional life, whether as a curator, collector, advisor, investor, and all will offer different perspectives on their interactions with galleries in the marketplace. Uh, Guy, I'd like to uh, start with you. Um, what does an art fund accomplish, and is it a solely a mechanism for making money? Uh, there are two questions. Uh, I'll deal with the second one first, if I may. No, is the answer. It's not solely a mechanism for making money. It's more complicated than that, but our investors clearly are looking to make money in the longer term, but it's also a lot of our investors use an art fund not simply to make money, but as a diversification. So sometimes it's a hedge against other markets, it's a way of placing money, and it's also a residual repository of value as well as being a means of making money. So whilst making money is not insignificant, it is not the sole perspective of the art fund. Could you ask me the first part of the question again? Yeah. Um, what does it accomplish? So is that a slightly different interpretation? Yes, I think we've accomplished, um, well, we, we, we are one of the very few, or one of the, we are really the only art fund that is actually still going. I mean, many have launched and many have folded. We're now 14 years on and we're still in existence. What have we accomplished and what might we accomplish? So far, I think we've accomplished the fact that we're beginning to get people to understand that art is really a viable and bona fide asset class. And whilst this, in purely financial terms, might seem rather narrow-minded, actually, I think the broader aspects of that are extremely important to all collectors and curators and museums and institutions around the world. Take a look, for example, at the awful trouble that Detroit got into last year, or is still in, and how the debate about whether the art in the DIA could be monetized against the debt. And there was a whole raft of debate about whether art was a bona fide asset class. Could it be used to subsidize or guarantee the debts of a city and whatever? So I think that in setting up a fund and in a fund that continues to exist, we have broadened the whole outlook of the way people in the whole world see art and the function that art can have in a modern 21st century society. What have we achieved, or what might we achieve? Who knows what we might achieve? Philip Hoffman, our chief executive who founded the fund 14 years ago, is a very ambitious man. And he started with a, a series of long-only funds where people we essentially we just bought, and we held, and we sold. The first of these has nearly completed its full cycle and will have sold out by the end of 2015. The second and the third are currently running. And Philip is looking at imaginative, and new and different ways of trying to bring people who perhaps weren't initially interested in art for its own sake into the market 
and so it's bringing money into the market. It's also raising awareness. And in a sense, the answer is limitless. We, we, could, we, could, we could, I don't know how far we can go, but I'm optimistic it's a lot further than we've gone so far. So uh, there's an old adage that art is easy to buy and hard to sell. Is that true <laughs> in your experience? Uh, it's um, <laughs> not of your divine. <laughs> it's easy to buy expensively, um, very easy. It's very, very easy to spend a great deal of money on art very quickly. I think that value resides essentially in three elements, price, quality, and time. And one needs to get a proper balance of all three of those. If the price is right in the current market, if the quality is good, and if you're not in a hurry, that is where value resides. Are you looking for uh, new works or works that are undervalued? New meaning primary market, uh, maybe undervalued, can also exist in the primary market? Or are you also looking in the secondary market where you think there exists value, but that's kind of untapped? We, we, we deal on both the primary market and the secondary market. And on the secondary market, we're looking at perhaps, uh, for whatever reason, works of art are available that are perhaps a little less than the current market value. The seller may be in a hurry, there may be other issues or whatever, or it may indeed be that we feel a painter or an artist is not as fully appreciated as we think he or she ought to be, and, and perhaps buying it now might give dividends in the future. On the primary market, again, we're looking at young artists, we're looking at artists who are beginning their careers, and we are trying to work out who are the really good ones are, because they will still be around in 5, 10, or 15 years' time. Now that, as we all know, is notoriously difficult. And so whilst we're not going to get it right all of the time, we hope to get it right more of the time than less of the time. So um, are you buying artists in depth, or uh, are you diversifying and trying to buy many artists from different periods? We have old masters in some of our funds. We have 19th century, we have impressionist, we have classic modern, and we also have one or two funds that, or elements of one or two funds that concentrate on the last 10 or 15 years. In those areas, we have built holdings in one or two painters. So yes, we are buying in depth, but we're also diverse. So we're doing both actually at the same time. So where we think we found a painter who we really rate and think is very, very good, we will buy not just one work, but maybe more. And where you know, we also think we need, perhaps, we may not like a particular painter, but we see commercial value in it, we will take a holding in that painter for the fund. Um, I mean, I've read a little bit about art funds. It's certainly not my area of expertise. But uh, it appears that your fund, in particular, has longevity and has had tremendous success. How do you think that that has happened, and do you take lessons from funds that didn't succeed? Um, Fernwood was a fund that didn't succeed. Right. Um, Fernwood collapsed after a great deal of money was raised, and then the man who raised the money decided the best way to travel the world was in private jet and have limousines meet him at every airport and to stay in the fanciest hotel he could find. We didn't think that was a very good model. Um, <laughs> We're still in business, Fernwood isn't. You know, I think, uh, yes, of course, we learnt lessons from other painters, uh, from other funds. And we have made mistakes, and not every one of our purchases. Though, in fact, um, of the, in fund one of the 80 objects that we bought, we still own about 20. But uh, of the 60 we sold, only four have been sold for less than we paid for them. So we, we, we've learned our own lessons along the way. We've made our own mistakes, and we've watched other people make mistakes. And, as you said in your introductory thing, there's nothing terribly new about what we're doing. People have been doing it for 100, 120, 150 years. The structure of how the money is raised is slightly new, but the practice is very old. So I'd like to direct the conversation to Alistair. Um, would you describe for us your roles as a curator for the bank, as well as an advisor to Deutsche Bank clients? How do you manage these two things, which are, are really quite different? I mean, on the one hand, you're looking 
at the collection, which has 55,000 objects. You're looking globally uh, at you know, how to build this collection. And then you must also be involved with uh, individuals on a one-to-one -one basis where uh, you're asked to um, advise them on how to either grow a collection or deaccession a collection. I mean, you have to make choices here between the bank, and maybe one informs the other. Yes. Um, in one way, I want to make, make it absolutely clear that they're very different roles, but then I'll explain how it had actually developed naturally uh, out of the process, because um, my job as senior curator, one of eight curators in for the Deutsche Bank collection is very much um, uh, showing that the bank is more than about money. We don't categorically don't buy for investment. In fact, I'd like to say that if um, more than 20% of what we're buying is going to go up, I've probably not done my job properly because we're trying to buy right across the board at a relatively low level, average under $1,500 over the years per, per item. Um, because it's been such a broad thing, my German colleagues were very successful early on, so we bought a 100 Richters and 300 Baslets, and it, so it evens out. But my point is that um, 80% or a vast majority of contemporary art doesn't have a secondary value. And what, what the press look at and what uh, most people perceive as the art, art world is just a tiny percentage of what's going on. So, uh, for instance, I went into a studio two days ago, the young student who hadn't ever, s uh, young, ever sold her work and that gave me enormous excitement, s s seeing something, and the energy, and the new, new newness of what was happening. Now, um, I mentioned a misconception. The misconception that uh, is that genuine art advisory is on the financial side. I don't give financial advice to our clients unless we have a contract. So, 99% uh, nine, of the time, I'm giving advice as a senior curator, giving them the background information on what is happening. We can then go into all the statistics that Guy and other people have access to and, and our own analysts. But most of our clients have conquered at least one market themselves. They're very astute when it comes to markets, all they want is the gossip, the background information, and uh, uh, someone to bounce ideas off. So in a way, um, I've just written a book, that's sort of my bigoted survey of 21st century art, and that's the sort of information that the clients are looking for. Right. Uh, as a curator of the Deutsche Bank collection, do you make a conscious decision about where to seek out art for the collection, or is it more a matter of convenience according to the art calendar? I mean, I've read a little bit of your book, um, The Global Art Co Compass. It appears that you're uh, on a plane more than you are on the ground, um, and you're seeing a tremendous amount of art in a lot of different places. I think it is important. I mean, we, um, you know, sitting in this room is Sylvain Levy, who has one of the great collections online, and it is possible to look at work online, and, and um, uh, it's very, it's a very useful tool. But uh, my my feeling is that, and um, getting back to the job of a curator and art advisor, is that we should be not getting in the way of the process of art. We should be encouraging the artist and the, the end producer or whatever um, to be 
r relating because uh, for me, a work of art doesn't exist except in the mind, in, the, in, the, in that process. There's no fixed work of art to my mind any longer. It's all about change, change, change. And if you're into that mind, mo role model, you've got to just keep on looking and... So you're responding continuously to uh, wherever there might be a, uh, uh, an event of some sort, whether it's an auction or a biennial or an art fair or maybe even simply gallery going in your own territory. Yeah, and, uh, and I accept that what Harold thinks is a, a great work of art will be different from other people. And if I'm an art advisor, my job would have been to know the sort of thing that he might respond to or even challenge <laughs> and say, that's absolutely opposite of what you like. <laughs> and it's so, because I think hatred is an important part in, yes. I, in the in the process, and um, so you know, we sometimes we need to be jolted out of things, and there is so much chance yeah. in the way we find things, whether it's online or whether it's just in a bar. Yeah, <laughs> they're all valid. Yeah, um, Deutsche Bank has been the lead partner of the Freeze Art Fair since uh, 2004, so for 10 years. Have the galleries relinquished their identity to the art fair organizers? I see a lot of art fairs. I don't like looking at art in art fairs, but um, they do play a lot of role. I mean, because you get so many people. I mean, I use art fairs, n not freeze, because uh, I can take a committee around that and we, I can argue the case and show them works because we're the sponsors. But mainly I use art fairs as centers. So for instance, I've been to Istanbul and Moscow in the last week. And in both cases, I, ha um, I had friends and contacts, one a collector and one a gallerist, who arranged for me to see, visit lots of artist studios. So I use it as center point. So, you know, maybe I won't actually see the work of art that I'm interested in, but you know, because the galleries are not making a huge amount of money off Deutsche Bank when they arrive and then we want to spend <laughs> a little bit of it. So right. it's often, but they're very useful for us. But And we're very proud to be connected with Freeze because I think it s uh, plays an important role in the London and New York scene. So, um, I think I'd like to ask this question of, of Guy and, uh, and of Alistair. How big a role do galleries play in the acquisition of works for the collection and or for the clients of the bank, realizing that you're not really making the acquisitions for your clients directly, but you are yep. thinking about you know, how it is to contextualize the work? And how does it work with regard to the primary market and and the secondary market. In other words, if you acquire a work on the primary market from a gallery, do you go back to that gallery when you're in the process of selling? Uh, would you like to comment on this first? <laughs> yes, is the short answer. I mean, we, 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 there were one or two galleries with whom we worked particularly closely in London. And when they present a show of a new painter or a painter that they've maybe had for some time, an artist they've had for some time, we, in a sense, we make an arrangement. We, we underwrite that sale. So we will actually agree to buy three or four works from that gallery, perhaps even prior to the vernissage, but certainly early on in the, in the process. This serves two purposes. One, it means that the artist is confident of some sales very early on. And two, the gallerist is probably covering his costs of the exhibition very early on. And we get favorable terms for doing that. But the quid pro quo is that when we deem our holding period to have matured, we go back to the gallery. So th the deal is that, that we wouldn't sell onto the secondary market through auction, or we wouldn't sell directly to private collectors, or we wouldn't sell through another gallery. We would go back to that same gallery. So we actually develop quite long-term relationships with galleries 
galleries who we rate, galleries who we think are showing artists that are interesting, painters and creators for, for whom we think there's a future and long-term value. But definitely it's a partnership between ourselves and the gallery in question. Would you like to add to that, Alistair? Well, uh, I mean, we hardly sell at all. I um, mean, until about eight years ago, we had a policy of not selling. So um, we're not buying with with the thought of selling at all. We do have a policy to buy from primary sources rather than sec secondary. And the, uh, the idea is that we're to support the artists. Galleries are incredibly important to us. And um, so we it is our main source of works. So I'd like to turn the conversation to Harold, who's, I think, got a very different um, uh, role to play in the, in the art world. Uh, you've been a very successful entrepreneur, and you've built a collection, which you started in 1994, of very important German and Austrian and American artists. Are there lessons that you can give to galleries uh, that you take from your experience as an entrepreneur and a businessman? This is a question. Uh, naturally, the organizations are quite different. And from that point of view, it's uh, difficult. Can we hear a little bit more? No. Hello? Yes? Yeah. Okay. So it's uh, very difficult to compare because of the size and the, uh, of the organizations. So organization-wise, I uh, cannot give an advice. Uh, the point naturally is how to, to, how to deal with the market. The market is very important for, uh, for entrepreneur, but also naturally most important for galleries or everybody involved. Uh, in this uh, in this kind of business, so there I have uh, I have the I, I have the feeling, or I watch that uh, many gallerists and do not react quickly enough to what happens in the art market. Yes, uh, it is rather clear since a couple of years. It, it becomes clearer and clearer that we have a. Uh, let me say, a high market with extremely uh, high prices. And uh, there is naturally uh, a, very, uh, a very good market for low-priced art. Uh, Jean once said, all good art comes from underground. And so uh, the art is not dead if, if only a few uh, can buy it. Uh, we I never envied people who bought red Ferraris. I, I have no, no problem with that. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm, con uh, I'm convinced that art will continue to be existent. But how? And it is rather clear that uh, many, many uh, gallerists of the middle class, I would say, are no longer capable uh, to make the run, to visit all the fairs, in uh, the, uh, the global market. You see, uh, this, uh, the, the market has become cruel for the, uh, the gallerist and cruel for the artist. Yes, the gallerist, or many, many gallerists, uh, seem to look forward only to the next, uh, next art fair. And then they say, OK, I must have the best for Art Basel, second best, third best for freeze, or fourth best, I don't know. Uh, yes, uh, and, uh, and then the other comes, we must, you must reserve the best works for us. And uh, so uh, there's an enormous pressure. And I would say they have much, uh, they have not, they don't uh, have enough time for the original job. Yes? Uh, they try to, uh, to equalize this by uh, making dinners, uh, we, you get from one dinner to the other. There are so many dinners that even the big bosses don't come anymore. You are invented by Ivan Wirth to a dinner, but he uh, hardly uh, appears. Or perhaps uh, two of ten dinners he appears, and then you sit for three hours uh, next, to, next to a stupid person, and you would rather run away, yes? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, so... I uh, haven't sat next to you. No, I, I <laughs> <laughs> 
Me too. I said, <laughs> I, I said, the eh, not the. <laughs> okay, uh, you understand what I mean. And, and uh, when uh, I think one should perhaps think, I I was I started collecting art when the market was really down in '94. It was a very hard time. There were a few collectors uh, uh, buying art at that time. And uh, then I had uh, the, uh, the following experience. Uh, the artists flocked together. They uh, made groups uh, to survive. They helped each other. There was a very nice, and good relationship between the galleries. They also helped each other. And, uh, and the galleries came to the collections. Uh, they, uh, they, uh, they visited me, I visited them, we had conversations, and we talked to each other. Now, I have only these stupid uh, 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 dinners, yes? Uh, and, uh, and I can tell you, uh, I'm uh, not, uh, I'm a rather important, let me say, collector. In the last seven years, no gallerist came to me to see it. I have a big museum, and this is, for me, uh, a really a shock. I see that they have not enough time to be to have time for their core business. Uh, to to refer to my uh, job, if I had a, a sales director who's not out with the clients, would be away after eight months. You see, uh, he shouldn't sit uh, sit there in the office and wait for people to come. He should go out and look for the people. And that is a critic I have to say. And this critic is, I think, a result of this murderous, of this really murderous uh, art system as it is now. Can you, can you uh, talk to us <coughs> about your recent announcement? So I said, uh, another word. Uh, my advice would be reduce all the stuff you do. Don't go to all fairs. Okay, you mu you must not be in Hong Kong. Uh, right? uh, there's, uh, there are also very nice regional arts, art fairs in Karlsruhe or wheresoever, or in Dienstlaken, or I don't know, in Rennes, in France, or whatsoever. That uh, sometimes make more sense. And I tell you, in the, in the regions, like in the region of Hamburg, I see there, if you, there are there openings now which were not visited very much years ago. Today, they are full. You can, so you can uh, make a good relation to young collectors, to young people there. And I think this is the core job of them. Just start again. If you want to lose your money uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a hopeless race uh, with Hauser and Wirt and, and others, uh, do it. But uh, I would advise not to do it. Excuse me. But that was my but advice. This <laughs> is, is <laughs> very, it's very pertinent <laughs> to uh, perhaps, I hope, this recent announcement that you made that you're going to collaborate with the Deutscher Hallen in Hamburg. And can you talk a little bit about that? And does that have to do with recentering uh, your interests in, in art in a perhaps more public fashion where people can access it in a, more in a, in a place that you care about? I, I, I felt uh, responsibility uh, for regarding the art I collect uh, that it is open to public. Uh, I want to be criticized. I want to be self-critical. Uh, you cannot live from advice only. Or, or that. Like I look for advice. If somebody tells me something, I listen to it. But uh, in the end of the day, I have to decide myself. And, uh, and so, uh, uh, you see, I, I see art not so much under the criteria of, uh, of beauty or aesthetics, I see art as uh, the mirror of the society. And if I is, is look at it like that, that I collect art which is very near to the society, which, which cries against uh, certain things in the society, and uh, then naturally I have to make it public. And then I have to look further when I, I'm, I'm now getting 71 year old, uh, I must say, ah, hey, what, what shall I do with this collection? So I look for a public solution in my hometown, Hamburg. And that is uh, a new way we, we, are, we, are, we do it since the beginning of 2011. Because I don't go to the museum where most of your works necessarily disappear in the depot. Yes, wonderful. Uh, uh, I cooperate with an uh, exhibition house. 
and uh, you see the Dijkstra had have three houses. Uh, this this uh, this house of my own is, if you want, so the idea is something like PS1, uh, 40 kilometers away, and uh, this is for the experimental part of art. And the other uh, uh, Dijkstra Halle is for international acknowledged art. And the third hall is for for photography. Yes, so they have divided it a little bit. And so I'm very happy with this solution that uh, the shows mostly not with my ex with, with my uh, with my uh, with my collection, but uh, they they do it in the in the in the in the museum or in the exhibition rooms where my collection is, and uh, the the uh, the for, for instance now there's uh, Gianfranco Barrochello, and you then we make Hanne Darbum, and then uh, parts of my collection which have a certain relation to that will be around it. So that is the idea. Mm -hmm. So I'm quite happy that uh, the collection is living in, this, in these exhibition rooms. That's all. And if it uh, is good like that, it, it continues until 2023, then um, perhaps then I still can make a decision, <laughs> hope, hopefully. <laughs> I think, you'll, I think you'll still be doing it. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> we hope so. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so <coughs> I'd like to open up the discussion uh, between you um, and to keep in mind that the symposium and why we're all here is about the future of galleries. Um, and here I'm really referring particularly to the traditional model of a bricks and mortar space that's run by a dealer. In this time of hyper-competitiveness, what can galleries do better, especially those that are the mid to small size dealers? Well, Harold's offered some views <laughs> about yes. what they shouldn't be doing. <laughs> and um, certainly, I think that uh, the model that grew up in the 70s, the 80s, 90s, when you look at galleries like uh, Bayala or Bergruen or uh, Cruger, these kind of this model is no longer appropriate. We do see the mega gallery with Gagosian, who wants to rule the world, and he has his stations you know, in all the major cities of the world. And uh, dinners, many dinners, how many dinners a year does Gagosian give? A thousand dinners a year. Um, <laughs> but I, I don't, he's atypical. And I think that galleries these days need to be much faster on their feet. They need to be much more receptive to their local communities. But also, there's a whole range, and I, I'm, I'm too old and too much of a dinosaur to know the answer to this, but presumably a whole range of electronic communication means and media and Twittering and Facebooking and goodness knows what. And this, I think, must be the future. It'll leave me behind, but I think it's where the future must be. In, interestingly, we had been discussing uh, a similar problem within the Deutsche Bank context, the where, where, which parts, uh, which offices have been responding to art, and and you know, and we have lots of systems. We have everything online. We have art stations. We, we if you come to Frankfurt, um, our Deutsche Bank Towers. Uh, we've got 60 floors named after artists from all around the world, and you'll see 60 screens with our collection floating up over it, and then you can press the button uh, of the 60 buttons underneath with the artist names, and the artist will come up and a little information. So we do lots of... It's all about... We, we have online art uh, magazine. We, we do a lot, but ultimately... The places where it's most successful, our art concept, and our art concept, only our art concept is for making a stimulating working environment, in, in engaging with the communities. So it's all about engagement. It only works if we get the buy-in from the staff in those areas, and where we get it is where us creators and um, artists connected to us, our program, are actually talking face-to-face -face with people. So ultimately, my advice to gallerists is that they've got to talk more to people. Of course. Mm. I, would, I would add to that, uh, if you see uh, the, also the development of the art fairs. Uh, art Cologne in 
1967 and Art Basel in 1969 first excluded dealers. They were not allowed. It was exclusively for galleries. Yes, and now Gagosian and all dealers are uh, in the fair. This is the development. Nothing to <laughs> blame. But I only want to say that also the big galleries, they are 50, 60, 7 percent today are dealers. Uh, I, I don't know whether the difference is clear between... Well, perhaps you yeah. would elaborate uh, yeah. the difference of what you're talking yeah. about. The, the galleries uh, are a rather new product uh, after the Second World War, where, uh, and they uh, try to follow uh, or build up an artist and follow him up from, uh, from the cradle to the grave in the, in the best sense if they don't run away uh, early, uh, earlier. Yes, but that is the ideal of... Uh, and they control the prizes. They are carefully with the prizes. Uh, they don't try to get the highest prizes. And uh, the traditional model uh, over centuries is the art dealer. And he, if he gets a high price, the highest price possible with the most stupid man he met, there's a champagne bottle is opened in, in, the, in the evening. Yeah? And if uh, uh, some uh, uh, auction houses uh, climb over a certain, uh, certain uh, risk, then people make standing ovation. I don't know why you make standing ovation if 50 million dollars are, are over it. It seems to me like, like the people coming uh, down in Mallorca with a with a plane, yes. and, and like if, if they have come down exactly correctly, yes, it is, a, it is absolutely a ridiculous, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, it is a matter of fact. You cannot, uh, it, I, you can, uh, you have to watch it, and you have to see it, and uh, therefore, uh, my advice, and that comes together with what you say and what I said for earlier, uh, also small galleries have to be aware that the global market cannot produce enough. Uh, uh, primary works. It's impossible. So the, 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 the secondary uh, work, or the secondary market has become more and more uh, important. I would say it's a renaissance of the secondary market in the last Okay, now I make my point. I would disagree with <laughs> quite a lot of what you said there. Okay. <laughs> I mean, first of all... We speak about songs later. <laughs> <laughs> but the notion that the gallerist who supports an individual painter or group of painters is a post-Second World War phenomenon is, is simply not borne out by the facts. I mean, you just have to look in Paris in the 1880s and the 1890s, and Charles durand well supported the Impressionist painters, backed them. He actually went bankrupt three times supporting the Impressionist painters. <laughs> When they were short of money and had to sell, he supported right. their prices at um, distressed auctions and that sort of thing. So th this, this idea that it, it has been around for, for, for quite a long time. So I, I don't think it's a, it's a post-Second World War phenomenon. That having been said, I think there's a very valid distinction to be made between those who support young artists or emerging artists or even mature artists, as you say, from the cradle to the grave, and those who are in the secondary market who are simply churning and moving things for the sake of moving them, and it's all about the action. I mean, look at Larry Gagosian. You know, all he cares about, he rings up every day to all his different people around the world. What have you sold today? What are you selling? What are you selling? What are you selling? You know, and there isn't a con much concern for the development of the artist as a painter, as an individual, and as something of value to society. And I think this is an issue that... Alistair has touched on, and I think it's an issue that was touched on in the discussion about Africa, and when, we, when, when Mark was saying about how Victoria Mira and others come from London and they try and buy up the people as quickly as possible and shift them out again, you know, they're missing the point that the artist has a function within society, the painter, the creator has a function within society, and that function is multifaceted, and it can be and should be about aesthetics and about beauty, but it's also, as Harold says, about reflecting the society in which we live, being a mirror to that society, being a critic of that society, sometimes a positive critic and sometimes a negative critic. These are all different facets of the same thing. And so I think that whilst historically it's been going on for longer than Harold suggested, his point is nevertheless valid. Uh, uh, yes, OK. I just <laughs> wanted to say, I just wanted to say, uh, which you referred to, naturally there were art dealers who supported uh, artists with 
500 sous uh, a month or something like that. And then they said, okay, I, I come, I come uh, in the summer holidays and then I want to have 50 works of you and I look for them. <laughs> that was a very human way to see it. They did, he didn't push uh, the artist, they, he could work as he wanted. Mm -hmm. And then he looked for it and they had a nice uh, uh, two weeks and then he came back with 15 works of Picasso, yes. Uh, that is, uh, I think, so in, th in this respect we, we agree. We agree. But, uh, yeah, this is clear, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I, th I think I, I, I disagreed with one thing you said about okay, the only market. one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> everything else is good. <laughs> 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 um, the, um, the fact that there is, isn't enough art there to, to, to fill the market, there is globally, there's so much wonderful art out there. Primary. Uh, primary. primary. So much. Re it, it's just that we're not looking at the, the perspective. But when it comes to how these gallerists, as you say, are very overworked, they're very small units. I'm talking about the, not the Gagosian, which is, you know, he could be selling anything. Um, and um, the, the younger gallerists, they're having to do so much but yet the I idea is that they should be focusing on where they're going to, how they nur nurture those artists, how they can get them into the right places. And on the whole, it is, as you say, they should be visiting the collectors like yourself, uh, et cetera. That is a very, very valid You said point. it, and I said it. Yeah. And I, I want to say, I want to make it clear what I mean, not enough. Yeah. I mean, not enough good art. <laughs> and not enough acknowledged art. So you see, the, the, the globalization uh, uh, forces you to do quick work, and uh, no uh, gallerist knows whether th such an artist is forget forgotten, will be yeah. forgotten uh, one and a half years uh, before. So that yeah. is the problem. Uh, if, if you make, uh, make, I make a lot of shows also, and uh, then uh, I make a show with Andreas Schulz and what's something. Who the, who the hell is Andrea Schulze? If I make uh, a show with uh, Picasso, yes, then I have something where many people come. So, uh, I mean, the art market means also that you have de to develop a name or to develop a style. And this is so extremely uh, difficult today. Uh, we, we have a lot of whatsoever uh, art uh, around us, but uh, very little I don't know the last styles. Do you see young Brit art? They are no longer Brit. YBA, art. The uh, young I don't know. The, you mean the, the middle aged ones? They're all, old now, he, he? They're, all, they're all old now. Yeah, 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 yeah <laughs> that's what I mean. So, uh, so you, you, we must not underestimate the name as a factor in the market. The name uh, is very important for everything. Well, that's but bra that's branding. But I think it? there's yeah. an issue here which is is the increased commercialization, the increased pressure on artists to Correct. be successful quickly. Yeah. And, 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 you know, Matisse didn't paint anything worth looking at until he was about 40 years old, yeah. you know? But now, even in art school, and I have children who study in art school, and I know many young people who are coming through the London art schools, and they get lessons in how to commercialize themselves, even at art school. Mm. And that, that, that is a radical change. That is a rally. And they, if they're not successful by the time of 25 or 28, they feel they failed. That's correct. And there's far too much pressure to but succeed far too quickly. Yeah. And actually, what an artist needs is a gallerist with a sense of perspective who can allow that artist to mature and develop. And so often, if they haven't produced some major work, they're dumped far too early. And I think that's very worrying. Mm. So, but the three of you occupy really privileged places in the art world in terms of the fact that you, you know, had very long careers and you've had uh, exposure to art in a lot of different places. And I'm thinking a little bit from the point of view of these galleries that are the smaller or the mid-sized galleries as opposed to, let's say, even the, the top tier or the mega galleries. And I think one of the conundrums is how do people connect and I understand the notion of uh, talking to people, but does this is this how can this be accomplished more in the place where the art lives? So, uh, you know, we have the internet, we have art fairs, you know, all kinds of things that take us to different places. But you know, galleries 
are, uh, at least the way I'm thinking of them, have places where they do exhibitions. Uh, they hope that um, their outreach uh, invites people to come in. But this is a really hard thing these days uh, to, to manage. And I think it's a bit of a conundrum. So I'd be interested to hear, even on an individual basis, like how often do you go to galleries in London? Do you just take a day and go around and look? Or how often do you do this in Hamburg, where you uh, go into a gallery you've never been to before? Not enough in my case. It's, it, it's never enough. Um, and th there is this dilemma, because artists want to have shows. Yes. And put them on, and quite rightly. And the shows in the galleries usually are the best place to see see the work, apart from in studios, etc. So, um, it there isn't. There's a, no easy answer. There here. is no easy answer, and you know, I it is my job to go out and look at galleries, and I sometimes sit down, and it takes me an hour and a half just to decide which ones I should be going to. So you go to uh, the internet to look at a list of some sort? Yeah, or a list of what's go going on. And, uh -huh. and then that slightly depresses me that it's taken me two hours or whatever. Um, but it's interesting to know how you sort information. Yeah, I, 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 I source it rather differently. Um, I mean, I, in a sense, I'm now actually not really speaking about my professional capacity, but <laughs> more as a lover of contemporary art and a collector of contemporary art in a private capacity. But Maybe I'm fortunate that I have children who are interested in art and who are at <laughs> art school. And I actually go to quite a lot of degree shows, and um, word of mouth is, is, is a lot of, what, uh, of the way that I decide where to go. And my children say, Dad, you've got to go to this show up in Dalston. Um, there's a lady whose name escapes me, but she ran some amazing exhibitions in a multi-story car park in Peckham. And... Uh, I quite like um, as uh, you know the underground, if you like, and, and, and word of mouth. So I'm not so much on the internet and, and, and magazines and, and print. It, it's word of mouth, and I think that's where the most exciting uh, opportunities can be found. What about you? Yeah, Harry? I um, go to the openings in Hamburg and also in Berlin, most of them. And uh, but I. Uh, uh, there is there's like for instance in Berlin the ABC Week, uh, and uh, this is uh, very uh, critical for me. You have to run through uh, through Berlin and find one uh, bad uh, uh, show after the other. So I try to really find out where I want to go and speak to the gallerist. I always look uh, to find the the talk to the gallerist. Uh, otherwise. Uh, just to go through, and I'm rather uh, disturbed in, 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 in openings, which uh, why everybody wants to say why this artist is the best of the world. I said I can't hear it anymore. Uh, they, uh, you, you have no time to look at something. Somebody talks to you and say this and this and that. Therefore, I like very much uh, the art fairs, uh, Basel and others, because you are freer there than in, a, in an opening. So therefore, I try to see the opening very fast and to look for the uh, for the to to uh, conversations with the with the gallerist and naturally i buy through gallerist main, mainly mm -hmm. this, uh, this is uh, uh, some uh, gallerist also on the art fairs so i stick to my old friends uh, and i don't want to change the horse and uh, buy from christies and sotheby's normally i don't do that for many many reasons but this is and it would be a longer talk, yeah? yeah? yeah. <laughs> and not France, no. <laughs> um, I think maybe it's a, a good moment to open up the conversation to the audience. And uh, I think we'll wait for a microphone and uh, see whether we've spawned some questions. Daniel. All right. Um, with this art circus being faster and faster and faster, and we mentioned the pressure towards young artists, I think there is a strong pressure as well for galleries to 
participate in all these fairs and I think the pressure as well from the artists in the ga uh, towards the galleries to um, as well participate everywhere and to show all these things and if they're if the gallery is not going to all these fairs then the artist might consider to go to a bigger gallery that goes to all these fairs to maximize exposure to maximize um, possibilities and opportunities for the artist because that's where the curators go this is now where the crowds go this is where um, the dialogue the conversations are happening um, is this going to spin out of control or calling just to slow down is that the solution or can we can we find a way to still find quality in this I think you've got a very good point what what you in effect what you're saying is all our problems are in the artist's mind. <laughs> <laughs> because I love artists and they're, they're my stars and I follow them. But I slightly controversially begin in the Americas chapter by saying if it wasn't for la uh, artists' weakness for New York City, the intellectual capital of the Americas would be Mexico City. Now, Artists love the market as well, and it's this weakness for the market than their pressure on the galleries forever to be both in the fairs and have shows and have catalogues and talk to the right collectors, be in the right museums. Yeah, okay, it's all in the artists' minds. And no, it's not going to get easier because there are more good artists out there competing away. So, poor gallerists, I love you but you're in for a harder time. I think one can look at this in sense in a parallel to, to record labels and um, how you know, they would sign up the pop stars and they would promote them and they would take them. And actually, this has been superseded now in the music market. Record labels are virtually dead and the artists are going straight to the market. And it's possible that we're going to see repeated in the art world what we've seen in the music publishing business. But those sort of things that have happened in different markets around the world. So you had the Indian and the Chinese, very much that sort of thing. And there was a one wave like that, and then it... Yes. I know, but yes. I still so think that, that um, if it, it, you know, that the, uh, the art market doesn't work in isolation from other markets or from general economic factors. Yes, I, I think also the artists, as he said, uh, are they victims or... Are they predators? I don't know, yes. <laughs> uh, 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 I, I don't to see uh, artists I, too I much as both. victims. They do what they, they have their own head yeah. and do what they want. Right. But uh, uh, I know now many artists who just say, uh, I only make two shows a year, and I uh, take more time for, for making artworks, so that there is a bigger, bigger uh, uh, I can offer more. They, they, if you if you handle yourself from week end to week end, that is a nightmare. And, it, and I think there are more and more artists who see that, that the quality of their work uh, will be better if they don't follow that. And I think that this is a... But that's a privilege usually born of success. Once they've achieved a certain threshold, they can afford yeah. to do that. Yeah, but also younger... Yeah. That depends. Therefore, I say... If one artist is not strong enough as to, yeah. to weak, as you said, he should work with others in a group. There's always what they did in, in, in difficult times. And that is also refers to, to, uh, to gallerists. Uh, why don't they, uh, don't they look for collaborations in other towns and exchange the program instead of making all uh, uh, the, the double? That would be my, uh, that is a certain logic in there that they should. Uh, th that was in the 90s, in the early 90s. There were so many cooperations uh, with the artists. And when the success came back, all these cooperations were blown yeah. away. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the artists mm -hmm. fought for themselves and for their own mm -hmm. success. Yeah. But mm -hmm. it's not just the moment of success, Guy, because in a way, there's, a, a, an inter uh, there's an honesty when artists are not selling anything earlier on. Yes, there. indeed. Uh, so you get, there, there they can look at the, <laughs> the market in a very different way. I mean, um, I helped buy a, a a, a client, a work by Keith Tyson. And yeah. the first work he made, he said, I'm not going to sell anything. And for six months, he drew this little, this work, which was his university of life, 600 room. 
think and he it sold it to me. <laughs> 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 I think I bought it after that. that <laughs> <laughs> it's the other version. Yes, there are two versions. Okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Does yours have a dart in it? Maybe it's a double. <laughs> <laughs> I think he, he, was, he was out of... Yeah. No one bought for a, right. a year, so we, we, you, there may be two. <laughs> You're check, absolutely check right. it's not a print. Uh, other question. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Sorry. I just wanted to ask Guy. Um, it was interesting to hear you come right on in and describe art as a bona fide asset class. Um, but as you're effectively the last man standing, I just wonder <laughs> how that can be how that can be true. And is art not a bit more complicated than that? Oh, it's certainly a great deal more complicated than that, as I think the debate uh, that we're having now has, has, has paid, drawn attention to, and indeed any debate that we have on the subject. That having been said, I think what, you know, an asset class is actually a, a financial description rather than an artistic description. So it's something born of the city rather than born of the West End. And I'm speaking in rather London terms there. Uh, but that having been said, I think that the increasing amount of money, the increasing amount of trading, the volumes and the liquidity is what has rendered art an asset class, as well as the increased awareness amongst people of desiring to collect art and desiring to own art. So it is actually two phenomena working from different sides to meet in the middle. about it being difficult to sell. Again, well, I just sort of, I'm just questioning the liquidity. Everything's point. <laughs> the difficulty or ease of selling is principally a function of price. So uh, everything has a market. But we started with the Devine quote, and I mean, he could sell anything. Well, he, he, he said, I'm not selling you a Gainsborough, I'm selling you a Devine, uh, which is the Gagosian and the big galleries and yeah. the art markets way of doing things. Indeed, and, and, and it was ever thus. And, and, yeah, and yeah. There, will, there will be Duveens in 100 years or 200 years time. Yeah. Georgina. It's another question for Guy. I was very interested that you <laughs> mentioned, you brought up the subject of the Detroit Institute of Art, because it seems to me that that actually is not an argument in the favor of investment. Because what's happened there is that this wonderful collection, which was held for the people of Detroit, um, is now, well, there have been threats to commoditize it and to make it disappear from public exhibition. Because if it does go into a fund, which I don't think will actually happen, and more generally, funds take art away from being seen, generally it goes into a, uh, a store somewhere while it's waiting to increase value. So. Is Detroit really a good example of the good power of turning art into an asset class? If you come to a good lender... No, no, you know. I, I think, <laughs> I think the, point I was, the point I was making there, Georgina, was, was not that I thought that was a good idea. I was simply saying because art has become to be seen as an asset class, people felt they could monetize the holding of the DIA. I think that was a mistake. And, uh, uh, but so, so I, in a sense, I was making... The point was that because it's, it's, it's increasingly seen in that way, is, it has, actually, the, the museum's fine, and that's not going to be, <laughs> it's, not going, it's, not, it's not going to happen. But it's there was a debate. Happen, it, no, no, it's not going to happen. happen. There was a debate for six months yeah. or so, uh, uh, so about the now. issue. And yeah. I think that debate could not have happened 10 or 15 years ago because of the way art has come to be seen over the last 10 or 15 years. But there are rules. Uh, of Simon, for instance, for dealing with the subject. It's, it's a long-term subject. In the uh, recent years, it was not only Detroit. There were uh, uh, institutions which sold, or in American institutions yeah, which but sold. But, uh, or the, yeah. but Detro the Detroit no, issue no, is actually quite complicated here. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. we're not talking about the whole of the holding of the DIA. Yeah. Actually, Detroit in the 1920s was rather forward-looking as a city. And the city of Detroit the, it, the entity that went bankrupt, the city of Detroit, yes. actually bought art which they put in the museum. The city doesn't own the museum, and 90% of the art in the museum is not owned by the city. Oh. But 10% approximately of the art in the museum is owned by the city. And so when they were drawing up a balance sheet of what Detroit 
owed and what Detroit possessed, that had to be listed on the balance sheet. That's correct, yes. And that was the issue. They've subsequently sorted out, and it's not vulnerable, but the scaremongering that the whole of the city of D the, the whole of the DIA was going to be emptied was always wrong, because actually very little of the art in the museum is owned by the city. And it's That's now a very solved. important it's clarification. clarification. The problem is well, now solved. The, the problem of Detroit is not solved by any, the, the, <laughs> by any means. The problem of, they stay in the museum. Yes, yes they stay in the yes, museum. They stay. <laughs> the problem of the art in the museum <laughs> is solved. The problem of Detroit is a long no, way no, from they being they solved. Be solved. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yes, this gentleman on the aisle. Uh, I think Georgina just mentioned one point about the, the funds or other types of uh, collectors storing the art. And we talked a lot in discussion about the sourcing of art, but we didn't mention the responsibility as collectors or as, as funds also to promote these artists, loaning these, uh, these works and making them available. And uh, I think now when we from the perspective of galleries. Uh, galleries are shifting uh, much more to, let's say, we're seeing many group shows with uh, many works that are not for sale. Galleries taking a little of the role of the museum. And how do you see this collaboration in your collections with private galleries uh, for not to, let's say, foster sale, but to promote these artists and help their careers? Uh, because uh, eventually you also uh, have a, a little of power of a bit of say in that. Who's man? <laughs> you. Well, well, you, you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, 55,000. <laughs> 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 we, we have a policy. I mean, what, what, in the uh, 1970s when we designed our concept, categorically, we're, we're not endorsing artists. We're trying to give them a platform across the board. So, uh, But our policy is to try and collaborate more and more with other institutions, including um, galleries. Obviously, we have to be careful in certain situations of vested interest and all that. that uh, but we, we are definitely having lots of debates among us curators about inventive ways of working with other people in, in the market to support artists that say we bought 20 years ago uh, and obviously we do feature them in our art magazine and we do do tours and we do include them in exhibi traveling exhibitions ourselves but we are looking for imaginative collaborations just as I, I'm sure you are. Uh, for me it's so naturally uh, this is part of my system to uh, assist the artist uh, and the artists naturally like to be shown pu in public, yes. And uh, of my collection, there are around 200 works always uh, on, loan, on loans, yes. So uh, I try uh, very much to support other in the institutions who have also uh, very hard times uh, now. So um, the question is really, it is not only, the, it's not only for the art works, it's for the whole art system. Yeah. Uh, which you have to, for which I feel I have to be helpful. Yes. Yeah. When we buy a work of art for one of our funds, uh, one of the questions we ask ourselves is in what museum or which museum might be interested in borrowing this work. And actually, during the holding time of the fund, we try and place <coughs> our pictures, the, the objects that we own, in museums so that whilst we own them and we readily admit we're buying them with a long-term view to investment, they're also actually available to the public. Not every work, and it's quite complicated, and the logistics, et cetera, et what cetera. What percentage? Of the, from, well, of the older pictures in the secondary market and the more readily placeable in museums, yeah. quite a high percentage. Okay. Of the younger artists, the contemporary artists, it's much more difficult. Yeah. So, 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 but, but we do... Logical. Nebulous, it's logical. But it's, it's logical. Yeah. 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 There's a lady right here. Hello. You've been talking about buying for the art found. Can you tell us about the selling? When do you sell? When do you decide to sell? Ah, good question. Uh, how do you do it? <laughs> uh, we, uh, we sell. Um, we monitor the market uh, pretty regularly. We're in the market. We observe the market. We see changes and evolutions and developments in the market. 
and we sell through a variety of different outlets. And that could be, as I explained earlier, often it's in partnership with a gallery, so we will go back to the original gallery or the gallery with whom we're continuing to work. And it may be a function of the gallerist's recommendation to say, I think now is the time to bring these works back to the market. We also sell through secondary, um, secondary galleries. Uh, we sell at auction and we sell privately. So, so as, as, as holders of assets, we have to try and maximize the sale value on each object. So we close no avenues. We're open to any avenue. But uh, Guy, can you tell us, how often do you review the portfolio? I mean, is this something where you do this on a monthly basis? You sit down and you look at your holdings and you, because I'm sure there could be spikes here and there that may be tempting. You know, you might say, oh, you know, now is the time. We should do this. But do you do this kind of systematically or do you respond to the market? We do it, we do it systematically on a rather longer time scale, so annually. Mm -hmm. But obviously being daily in the market and aware and attending fairs and uh, auctions and reading the press and seeing what's going on, we also will respond to the market. But we don't, we don't, uh, we don't do a weekly or monthly analysis mm -hmm. of our assets. Mm -hmm. No, it's an annual, it's an annual thing. Uh -huh. Yes, Ed? And, and different from other fonds, if I, in, if I compare this to fonds of uh, in the financial world, yes? Well, very uh, different. There you have the, you can see day by day yeah. uh, how the rates are. But in, in art, it is uh, impossible mean, to say. A barrel, of oil, is right. is, a barrel right. of oil is quoted every 30 seconds. You know, the market moves. Um, uh, uh, ICI shares or, or, or Coca-Cola right. is quoted. You know, Correct. Picasso is not quoted in, in the same sense. So, no. so, so no. It, it would, we, could, we could review everything on a weekly basis. It would be a considerable waste of time and energy. Right. Right. Absolutely right. or nonsense. Would yeah, it would be just nonsense. Yeah, it's right. just yeah. nonsense, yeah. 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 Right. yeah but so that is, the, I think, the significant about this so-called font uh, or the other kind of font because other fonts, if you take Buffett or fonts of Buffett, uh, you can absolutely control them. And, and for the financial world, I don't like princi principally fonts. That's because I want to make my own decisions. But if you want uh, to, if you have to, uh, or if you think of fonts, I think uh, the possibility co to control fonts is one of the of the uh, main questions. Yes, and uh, therefore, uh, some financial people say uh, you can, uh, uh, if you if you follow up uh, the curves of a fond, uh, then you can see the performance of a fond, like Warren mm -hmm. Buffett, over. 35 years, and then you can say, okay, uh, this is a good fund. But this is very difficult with art funds. It's mm -hmm. extremely uh, difficult. To say it's so, we're, yes? We're building a track record, yeah. uh, but it, it, it takes time, yeah. you know? And we've been going for 14 years. Warren Buffett, as he and says, did you go public with a, uh, with mm. a Yes, rate. We've we <laughs> the rate. Like Warren Buffett. Not it's, well. Again, it's not it's not quite as straightforward as, as that. But but yes, I mean uh, we're we're open with the market. We're open with journalists. We try and give a sense of what we've achieved and how we're achieving it. I think the most interesting crux will come at the end of 2015 when we've sold out completely of mm. the lifetime of our first fund. Mm -hmm. So we're still, so that's a still early days in a sense, yeah. in, yeah. In, in, in a business, in an industry that is uh, in its infancy. Right. Yeah. Ed? Uh, yeah, earlier Mr. Falkenberg mentioned that many galleries do not respond quickly enough to changes in the global market. I'm wondering, could you give us a specific example of where you've seen that? Yeah, too many dinners. <laughs> <laughs> well, more lunches. More. <laughs> That's my answer. <laughs> Still. <laughs> Others? In the front. Yeah. Yes, sir. This gentleman here. The yellow man. Thank you for taking my voice. Um, the um, question, I mean, is is actually maybe not less of a question, but of a kind of a statement that I really like what Harald said. Give, give us a, give us yes, a question, okay. if you would. Question, okay. Yeah. But, uh, thank you so much for yeah. that. Okay. Uh, 
the, what I really liked about what Harald said was that the same problem you see in terms of artists, you see now replicated even in art fairs and, and with galleries, the kind of snobbism that people don't go somewhere. And also, and so what he said that it replicates uh, society as such is this general phenomena where everybody wants everything at the same time, the same thing at the same time. And so what and is your people question? have uh, nowhere to look. Well, the question would be how to change that. But uh, you know, I just want to remember one thing which I really liked, and that's maybe an example. I once was at a dinner at Marion Goodman where I was placed around all these artists, and this is about uh, maybe 10 is, years ago. What is your question? Uh, thank you so much uh, for being so impatient. Um, the okay, my question would be how to change that. You know, I mean, right. you, you basically don't let That's me talk, question. but thank you so no, much. No, but I'm quiet. No. We understand. So representing here the artists, I mean, you invited me here to, yeah. to speak for the artists, and That's you don't question. let me talk. That's thank a question. You. That's a question. I asked the question. Yeah. Thank you. What change? How, how would you see it changing, Harold? Or what can we do to change it? No, I, I, I think I have said already what I see. Make more corporations and less dinners. Uh, speak more uh, to the people involved, not only to the uh, uh, to the to the uh, collectors, also uh, to directors, to institutions. Uh, uh, they don't have enough time for this for this uh, hard hard work, for this essential work. That is my opinion, and they should take more time. Yeah, I think I think it's communication, it's um, expression. I, I think we all of us. Um, Groan at the thought of another dinner and sitting, you know, through three hours or something Send like that. Send the invitations to me. I'm <laughs> happy. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, <laughs> but also, I think. No I think, I think how, God, you know, what's this? What's going on? We, we got a divergent <laughs> point of view. Um, Alistair said he didn't like looking at art in fairs, <laughs> whereas Harold said he did like looking at art in fairs because. Uh, the fairs, I'm not quite sure why Alice doesn't like looking at art in fairs, but he it's said he It's just didn't. not the best way of presenting. Fair. I, question, love, I love yeah. okay, it's a question, reminder of it. I think yeah. Whereas I think what yeah. Harold yeah. liked about fairs was that he could wander freely, he could wander in and out, he wasn't being pounced upon by yes. a predatory salesman or woman trying to tell him that this was the greatest artist that ever lived, and that he could wander through a fair at his ease, come and go, look yeah. at a painter, go and have some lunch, come back and look at the same painting again. And Sit I think in the Deutsche Bank lounge. Have a, have <laughs> yeah, <obviously. laughs> have a very good lunch. You know, in the, it, Alistair's much more concerned about food than art. You know? <laughs> but anyway, that's... I'm, I'm that's concerned about li <laughs> life. I don't know the difference. <laughs> so I, I, I think it's a question of... of that, that in life... And whatever business was in, the huge commercial imperatives, we have to make a living, we have to eat, we have to, to, to live, we have to whatever. And, 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 and greed is this constant motivating factor in human activity. So I think to wish this away would be naive. But I think that the model of how we sell, galleries sell art to the would-be collector will evolve and can evolve. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure that that, that uh, in my ignorance, I still feel convinced of this, that it is the new media, the electronic media, and the digital age that, that will hu make a radical change to the bricks and mortar gallery over the next 10 or 15 years. Thank you all. Uh, this has been a really interesting discussion. I appreciate your time and thoughtfulness, and um, I'd like to say, well done. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dorsey. Sorry, was there a last question? Oh, okay, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I think we have a few minutes. Okay. Just, uh, and uh, after this, we have a five-minute break uh, before the final presentation. You're not off the hook yet, sorry. No, no, no. This, no. One's, your, this one's yours, Alistair. I've got lunch. <laughs> <laughs> we want to travel uh, lunch I, a bit earlier. I hope I've got lunch with Sylvain. I have an invitation <laughs> for lunch. <laughs> Do I have an Th invitation for lunch? Yeah, oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much for giving me the, the chance to ask the last question. But uh, my question is for Guy. Uh, how many persons are concerned by the art fund? How many persons have been personal have invested in the art fund? And the other question, if you don't think that 
it's a kind of mirror of illusion today to consider the art market like a real market. And you know, we are making a lot of parallel with the market, but the art market is a very small market. It's, it concerns very, s the, the way you're doing it, concerns very, very small type of persons. Don't you think that, uh, if you think that you can expand the number of people, like uh, funds in, uh, in, the, in the finance, for instance, with the art market? How many persons are concerned by your art funds? We, we have about $350 million under management in various different funds. That but how many persons? That represents about 125 different investors. But some of those investors are units that represent more than one person. So we're not absolutely sure how many individuals are involved, but we have a b 100 and about 125 different investors, and we have about $350 million under management. That's very small in the grand scheme of things when you think of uh, what a hedge fund might have under management, $3 billion or something like that. You know? so, so we are tiny, tiny, tiny in the grand scheme of things. The art market also is tiny in the grand scheme of things. The volumes transacted through the art market, I think, you know, Christie's or Sotheby's do 20 or something billion dollars a year. You double that up for all the dealers and things like that. So maybe the art market, I don't know, Georgina, what? what 65, thank you very much. 65 billion, billion, billion. billion. 65 billion dollars. Uh, that's infinitesimally small compared to the oil market, the armaments market, the securities market, I don't know, whatever. So the whole, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of looking at quite a microcosm of the whole world economy when we're looking at the art market. But nevertheless, that's the world we're all in and it's the world we're here to debate. You know? So I think this is it. Thank you, Dorsey. Thank you, Alistair. Thank you, Dr. Falkenberg. And thank you, Guy. Thank One you. More time. Thank you.